Father, here we are, standing in your presence. Send us forth and give us your heart for the nations. Amen. We have another song that we sing around here, and it, one of the lyrics says, Let my heart break for what breaks yours, God. Amen. And that's what we want to do. How are you this morning? Doing pretty good. Summer's early. Having a good time when the sun's shining, even when it isn't. Amen. I would like you to stand with me, if you would, for the reading of God's Word. This is the fifth Sunday of the month, and that happens about four times a year, and we decided a year or so ago that every fifth Sunday, because our church has such a heart for reaching the lost, that we would use that fifth Sunday four times a year to share about missions and to share about outreach and what's going on. And you're going to be excited this morning because every one of you that are part of our New Life family here on a regular basis, if you've ever tithed or given a single offering, penny or a dime, then you have a part and you have invested in everything that I'm going to talk about this morning. And when you see what all is going on through your life and through your generosity, it's going to blow you away. You're going to leave here feeling really good about yourself today. Amen? And if you haven't given yet, we're not going to take another offering today. But if you come back next week, we will take your offering. (laughs) Amen, if you want to be a part of it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 36 through 40 there for a moment. We can say here at New Life that the purpose of our church can be summarized in the two scriptures that I'm about to share with you. This is the reason that we exist. This is the reason behind everything that we do. And by the way, let me remind you again, we have a membership class that we're going to be sharing this evening. I'll be teaching right here in the sanctuary at four o'clock. And if you're interested in church membership at all, even if it's your first time here and before you leave today, you think, you know, I might like to check this out. Sign that little connection card and make sure you hand it to one of these usher-looking people on the way out or at the information booth. And sign up for that class and come see what we're about. I'm going to give you a whole summary, overview of our church and ministry and what we do and how we do it. But the purpose of our church can be summarized in this single sentence based on two key scriptures. Here at New Life, we believe a great commitment. How many of you are into great commitments? Are you? Really? We believe a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. We have a great church. I think it's the best church in the world, not just because I'm the pastor, but because of you people and what goes on here. If I thought there was a better church around here anywhere, I'd be there. Amen. The great commandment is this. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You can fulfill the will of God for your life. If you truly, in Spirit and in truth, learn to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and put Him first before anybody or anything in your life. Dear sister walked up to me during greeting time and she said, I can't believe the things that God is doing in my life. And I said, if you walk with Him and you will sell out completely and don't half step, God will continue to do those things in your life. He is a good God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. I'm having a better Sunday this Sunday. I came in here last week, and before church, I I asked my wife on the way home, I said, was there a full moon or something? Everybody I run into had some complaint before church. Man, I couldn't even hardly sling it off when I got up here. This morning's been exactly the opposite. I had that sister say that. I had another one grab me by the arm back there in the aisle before church. She said, I got healed last night. I am healed. I said, good. She said, no, I am healed. (laughs) Glory to God. God's a good God. The second, that's the great commandment or the great commandments. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the next is what we call the great commission. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said this. He said, go and make disciples of all 
nations, all of them. One of the things, well, there's a lot of things I like about the end of the book, but one of the things I really love is when we get to glory one day, all of us together, when this age as we know it is over with, the Bible said that we are going to stand with a multitude that cannot be numbered out of every tribe, out of every nation, out of every tongue that's ever been on the face of the earth. And we'll all be able to get along then. Amen. But he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, that's the key word, teaching them to obey everything, not a few things, not the easy things, not the convenient things, not the things that we just like. He said, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Amen. In fulfilling our commitment to these verses, New Life supports ministries in our communities all across the United States and all around the world. The Bible teaches us to take the gospel, every one of us, from right where we are, no matter where it is, and to start there and to go out and to touch as far out and as far and wide as we possibly can with the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lifetime. And we're doing that, church. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just come before you right now and thank you for your goodness and your love. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you were long-suffering with each and every one of us, Lord God, that, Father, while we were yet sinners, while we blasphemed your name, while we broke your laws, while we disobeyed your word, even in those days you loved us and sent your Son to die for us. But, Father, thank you for the mercy that kept us alive. Thank you for the mercy that allowed your Holy Spirit to overshadow our hearts, convict us of our sins, and bring us into eternal life. As we believe on you and trust on you and your atoning work on the cross, we are passed from darkness to light, from death to life. And Lord, if we truly believe in our hearts that you, one Savior, died for all, then we have to believe that until people come to a saving knowledge of you, all are dead in trespasses and sins. And Father, we have to take this gospel as far and wide as we possibly can. And I thank you for each person in this church. I thank you for their labors of love. I thank you for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I thank you, Father, for all of their giving of themselves, of their time, of their resources, Lord God. And Father, I believe, I know, and you know, that Lord, dollar for dollar, penny for penny, dime for dime, <laughs> God, we are doing all that we know how to do. And Lord, if there's more that we can do, then Father, open our eyes. Here we are, Lord. Send us, is our prayer this morning. Father, touch our hearts through your word. Give us a burden for what you have a burden for. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Father. And God, help us in the passion and love for you and for your Son and for the Holy Spirit in us. Help us to fulfill your will, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. You may be seated now. If you said amen, that's a dangerous prayer. Amen. God, use me to do your will. I want to talk to you today about missions. I want to talk to you about world missions. I want to give you an overview of what we are all doing together. And the first couple I want to introduce you to is Kelly and Cindy Robinette. Their beautiful faces are up here on the screen. They are missionaries with the Assemblies of God in Batambang, Cambodia. I met Brother Kelly in 1989 when I went to Thailand. I met him in Thailand. We were in southern Thailand, about as far down to the tip as you could go. We were four and a half hours from any electricity or telephones or anything else. We were right on the border of Malaysia. And he was a pastor that served there, the Assemblies of God. He was a missionary to Cambodia, but he had come down to be an interpreter for those of us that had come from America to build a church in this particular area in Thailand, and then we would preach on the weekends in churches, and he would be our interpreter. He was one of the first missionaries that we began as a church back in our beginning. Uh, he was one of the first missionaries that we began to support financially. 
We in leadership decided years ago, most of us had been in churches where they supported 35 or 40 missionaries to the tune of maybe 10, 15, 25, $35 a month. We decided at the outset of New Life Christian Ministries that rather than do that and do a whole bunch of missionaries with a little bit, that the first thing we would do is we would support missionaries that we knew personally and could get involved with their work. We could actually go to where they served and we could minister with them and get to know them and rather than have 40 or 50 of them, right now I think we have seven or eight, the number's changing, it's growing a little bit, we have seven or eight that we have supported in the biggest ways possible. We've done it through sending missionary teams over to minister with them and that sort of thing. And I want you to know that right off the bat, that we are involved with works all around the world in big ways, and I'm going to show you some of it. This couple currently are operating the Sale of Home Bat and Bang Christian School for grades kindergarten through 12, and you help support that. They're also involved with newly constructed Teen Challenge Women's Center in Phnom Penh. If I said the words or the name Khmer Rouge, how many of you would know what I was talking about? Cambodia once had a leader that was like the leader of Korea right now. The man was nuts, and he killed thousands and thousands of his own people. And he had this scourging. And where brother and sister Kelly minister is in the areas where this thing took place, and there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of children that have no parents that have been killed, families that have been destroyed, and they work in the hospital there. Cindy is a nurse. They work with orphanages, they've started schools, and they're doing everything they can to help these broken families and broken people get their lives back together after all that they've been through. Two years ago, we as a church family raised the funds to purchase a zero-turn riding mower to help in maintaining the school campus. It's, a, it's about 120 degrees most of the year every day and humid in Cambodia. It's the jungles like you see when they show us the documentaries of Vietnam, which is right next door to it. And they had this big schoolyard of this school that they were having to push mow. And you know how grass is when it gets rainy season around here, how fast it grows. With this push mower and as much grass as they had to mow, by the time they got done doing it once, most of it was grown up again. And I'm talking foot high stuff. And Brother Kelly was here, and a lot of our missionaries will come. You're going to get to meet some of them firsthand over the next couple months on the fifth Sunday. Some of them are going to come and speak with us. And Brother and Sister Kelly are going to be here this summer, too. And you'll get to meet them. But we bought a zero-turn riding mower and was able to get it shipped over there to take care of that school. And you did that, all of you. All of you that give here at New Life Christian Ministries help them do that. We also are involved with missionaries to Asia in the Philippines. In January of 1992, we began supporting a local couple who were working in the Philippines. One of the major problems was sending pastors, their pastors, Filipino pastors, to the U.S. to be trained because they don't have any, you know, they didn't have any Christian colleges to train their pastors in. The problem was they would try to send these Filipino people over here to be trained for ministry and like you, they would fall in love with the old U.S. of A. And then they didn't want to go back home. And the missionaries that we began to support and work with over there have started three Bible colleges. You're going to see, bring one of the other slides up here in a minute. Can you bring the next one up or back it up maybe? How many of you, yeah, back, uh, next one. Next one, yes. How many of you see, there you go, that's what I was looking for. See the name on that church? New Life Churches. We've been supporting these people in the Philippines for about 40 years. Not only, yeah, 40 years, 20 years, but not only financially, but we've been sending teams over there. I've been over there. Some of our people have been over there a couple times. I go over when I go and preach to pastors' conferences and their wives. But because we are so involved with this church and ministry over there, They've built three Bible colleges, they have a couple compounds, and there's over a hundred churches that have been started through these colleges and these pastors. And we've had such an influence on them that they've called their churches New Life Churches in the Philippines. We are a non-denominational church. We are not affiliated with a denomination here in America. 
And people ask me, they say, are you a denomination? Are there other New Life churches? I said, yes, there's over a hundred of them, but they're all in the Philippines if you want to visit one. <laughs> but again, you folks, through your giving, through your ministry, others have actually gone there. We are ministering to thousands and thousands and thousands of Filipino people and training pastors, training ministry leaders, raising up churches, raising up schools. All of that happens even while we are here worshiping at New Life on a Sunday morning. Now, they're 12 hours ahead of us. You know, when, it, when it's 12 noon here, it's 12 midnight there, and they're a day ahead of us. They've already had church today. They've already shared the Lord's Day and probably on their way to going to bed. Most of them don't have electricity where they live and go to bed when it's dark. But anyway, we are helping to train pastors. And this ministry, we are also currently working with the second generation. The mom and dad that started the ministry over 20 years ago have now retired from that ministry, and their son has taken on the leadership of this ministry over there. So we're working on a second generation ministry there. We also share with Pastor Fidel and his wife, Alta Gracia. They are pastors in Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic. They're actually outside of Santo Domingo. Anybody ever been to Santo Domingo? That's the capital of the Dominican Republic, and it's a nice, really nice Caribbean city where these folks that we support minister is out on the edge of it where about 30 or 40,000 people at least 14, 15 years ago when we first started with were living in the middle of a garbage dump. But we've gone down, we send a team every year about the end of January, 1st of February, a team of anywhere from 15 to 20 from our church go down there for a week or two and they minister and we hand out the Samaritan purse boxes. We sent a youth mission team down there first with Team Mania Missions back in 1998. And during that week, they met a young pastor who shared his vision for ministry. And the mission team came back excited about what he had shared with them. And we began supporting this man's ministry. And he didn't have anybody else supporting him at the time. He was just a young minister who felt the passion and burden for God. He has now built some clinics. They have built schools. He's become a leader. He's working with the government of the Dominican Republic. He is Franklin Graham's right-hand man now for Samaritan's Purse, the shoe boxes of handing them out in that part of the world. And this is because you give and you support and people go there and people minister. And the last time I was down there, I think about three, four, five years ago, when I went the first time, everybody was living in a garbage dump. They asked me to preach a revival in the middle of this dirty crossroad, in the middle of this garbage dump. They said, we want you to preach a three-night revival. Never so scared in my life. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know what to preach. What do you do if you're from America and live like we do, and you go and you stand in front of people who are living in a garbage dump, who are picking their food out of the trash? What do you tell them that God wants to do for them? I was sweating bullets the night before, <laughs> and the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, tell them the blind see, the dead are raised. <laughs> Bodies are healed, and to the poor, the gospel is preached. And I shared with that community, I said, Americans aren't going to save you. Your government isn't going to save you. Robbing and stealing and fighting with each other to try to get your food out of these garbage dumps, that isn't going to save you. But if you'll give your hearts to Christ, if you'll start sharing the little bit that you have, and you'll start working together, God himself will begin to meet the needs of your life. You better believe the gospel if you preach that to people standing in a garbage dump. But you know what? The last time I was down there was about 10 years later. They have almost built a city in the middle of that garbage dump, including some churches, some dental clinics. Amen. And it's changed their lives. The gospel will heal anybody anywhere that you go, in any situation, in any circumstance. Amen. And it'll heal you too. Among the things that Pastor Fidel had envisioned were a clinic and a Christian school, both of which have come to fruition. Uh, he's also a part of an organization in Santo Domingo fighting same-sex marriage and the LGBT agenda in the Dominican Republic. He is working with the government to try to keep that from happening. The Dominican Republic 
is the only flag in the world that has a Bible on the emblem in the center of their flag. It's an awesome thing. And this pastor has such a burden, not just for the people that he lives with in that garbage dump, but for all of the Dominican Republic. He loves the Dominican Republic like you love the good old U.S. of A., and he wants to get every person he can saved. He's the director of Samaritan's Purse Operation, Christmas child there in the Caribbean. He oversees the distribution of the shoebox gifts, teaching the gospel to the children and their families. In 2004, we as a church family uh, sent its first mission team there to Santo Domingo. We now send a team every January to go down there, and they have literally handed out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those Christmas shoe boxes that we put together. They get to go down there and hand those out to hospitals and orphanages and villages everywhere, and even into Haiti. Where they are is right on the border of Haiti in the Dominican Republic, and you know, we get to minister to Haiti as well. And all of you are doing that. Every one of you that put together one of those boxes, those Christmas boxes for the kids, or you give in offerings here at New Life, you are helping to support this pastor, you're helping to support all of this ministry. You're going to stand before God one day. There's one of our teams, one of the latest ones, I think. We're all together going to stand before God one day, and you're going to have people thanking you for sharing your heart in the gospel that you have never laid eyes on in this world, but they will be there because of your giving. We met a man a few years ago from Kampala, Uganda. Some of you remember Pastor Andrew Matumbo. He is from Uganda. He was visiting in the United States with a uh, fellow that was my best friend in junior high school. He's now a pastor too, and he was visiting his church, and that's how we came in contact with him. Many of you met him here because he visited here two years ago. He's the pastor of Revived Glory Church in Kampala. He teaches and writes books on worship, he leads a church, he works with single parent families, and has a radio outreach ministry in Uganda, Africa. Brother Peter, who I'm going to talk about in a little bit, he's away doing some missions and speaking this morning, but he went over to visit him last summer and uh, actually be there to be a part of his ministry and see what's going on. So you are ministering to people in Africa. Can you say praise God? If you ever prayed one of them prayers, oh, Lord, please don't send me to Africa. <laughs> well, he hasn't sent you yet, but we are together as a church collectively sending the gospel to parts of Africa. And then we have Davy and Jewel Rees. They run New Birth Christian School in Los Toros. They are another couple in the Dominican Republic. Davy and Jewel are our most recent missionaries. We just sent a small team down there to get involved with them. Davy's a Dominican pastor. He met his wife, Jewel, while she was in the Dominican Republic doing missions work. Some of you single ladies that can't find a good man here, follow Christ. He might lead you to one somewhere. It said they later married. They now live in Los Toros in the Dominican in the northwestern mountain region of the island. They serve in the church and Christian school. They work with the children from Le Maita, a village a couple miles away, and about 30 children from Le Maita attend the school. Currently, for first through fourth grade, the goal is to increase their minister, ministry to include more grades in the school. How many of you know if you're really going to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to go after them as young as possible? Because if you don't, Islam, Buddhism, all the other cultic religions in the world that the devil has at his command are going to go after them first. We need to reach these people, and you're helping us to do that. How many of you have ever seen a Gideon Bible? You know what a Gideon Bible is? You're in a hotel room somewhere and pulled open a drawer, or sometimes they're laying on top. This is a Gideon Bible that was placed in a hotel back in about 1948. In 1948, somebody placed a little nightstand in this hotel room, put this Bible in it, not knowing that in 1976, a long-haired, drunk, doped-up drug addict would come in every night from his shenanigans and pull this thing out of the drawer and read it just like any other book. And for two years before I got saved, I read this thing. I read almost the whole Testament. It, 
It was doing its work in my life. It wasn't doing everything. I hadn't come to Christ as my Savior, but I started running around and making restitution for stuff and trying to figure out what adultery and fornication really was and, you know, try, trying to do what the book said. This book had been in that hotel room. By that time, I called it the Roach Hotel. It's about five minutes from here. It was a two-room hotel that had been turned into two-room efficiency departments or apartments with complete with all the roaches you could look at and I started reading that book somebody had put that Gideon Bible in there and they prayed over that Gideon Bible and God used it I've been invited for the last 39 years different times different places to go to Gideon's meetings when they have their meetings and give my testimony of how God used this and a lot of other things to change my life of course we're involved in Gideon's some of your giving goes to Gideon's International, and they are not only reaching adults in hotel rooms, but they have spread out now. They are going in; they're still able to go into the schools in America and all different places all over the world. They are touching thousands and thousands of kids and adults with the gospel, and you are giving all the time to help that happen. So you thought you wasn't doing much, but you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot, New Life. <laughs> And then a few years ago, we got involved with Mercy Ships. Any of you ever heard of Mercy Ships? You're giving to them too. This is the Africa Mercy, or Africa Mercy Ship. It's a floating hospital is what it is. Many people in Africa have little or no access to health care. There are only 2.5 physicians per 10,000 people in Africa. Think about that. You know how we don't like to sit in the doctor's office for three or four hours and wait for a doctor, you know, for an appointment that we have? I don't like it either. Imagine now if there were only 2.5 doctors for every 10,000 people at your doctor's office. Africa Mercy brings volunteer medical teams and sterile operating rooms directly to people who would otherwise go without care. It's the world's largest civilian hospital ship providing state-of-the-art care to those that are in desperate need free of charge. How many of you know nothing's free? It takes a lot of money to do all that and you're helping to give to that. A part of your regular tithes and offerings help support mercy ships. Amen. They have volunteer medical personnel who go on mercy ships. They perform surgeries such as cleft lift and palate, cataract removal, orthopedic and facial reconstruction as well as providing dental treatment. They also train local professionals who in turn train others increasing the access to medical care locally. They also train local people in hygiene and basic health care and work with local communities focusing on water, sanitation, education, infrastructure, development, and agriculture. And they share the gospel with them while they're doing it. Glory to God. <laughs> Is it all right we give some of your money to that? Amen. And then there's Samaritan Purse, which is close to our hearts. That's the Operation Christmas Child. If you hear us talking about OCC around here, and it's usually about right before Thanksgiving through the Christmas holidays, over 15 years ago, we learned of this ministry that provides shoebox gifts to children around the world, and they use these gifts as an opportunity to teach the children and their families the gospel. You know, we encourage you to go and, and get a shoebox, or some of you buy some of those plastic, looks like Tupperware boxes, and you fill it up. We, every year we give you a list of what you can and cannot put in those things. And you put those little gifts. And most of them are things that most of us as Americans don't really wouldn't even want to bother with. But I have been down there in those hospitals. I have been down there in those orphanages. You would think we had given those kids. You know how sometimes we give our kids the greatest gift in the world and they're like, yeah. I'm telling you, you can give them a pad and colored pencils. And you'd think you'd given them a Mercedes Benz, man. I mean, they're just, <laughs> they're just excited because they have nothing. They have nothing. Most of them, you know, live in cardboard and tin shacks and houses that they put together out of pieces of stuff out of garbage dump. And, and all over the world, there are children that are abused that the only love that they ever really receive is that Christmas box. Somebody somewhere cares enough about me to give me something more than just food and water. And it impacts their lives. I don't remember last year, we had, I think over, was it over 300 or 400 of those boxes we packed last year? 
You know, Amanda, right off, it was over 300 from our church, but there are thousands and thousands of them packed by churches here in the United States. And Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, started this thing. And it is touching lives all over the world. You know, you don't hear about this kind of stuff on the evening news. You don't hear about the good things that God is doing and that God's people are doing. But we are working all over the world, and so are you. A few years ago, we began holding an annual shoebox packing party. In fact, there's some people, Miss Sherry back there, who came to visit our church for a packing party, and she never left. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> so ministry happens in many ways, but we're involved in that as well. Pastor Peter Guadalupe. Pat, yeah, you can give him a hand. Now, Pastor Peter and his wife came here originally from Brooklyn, New York. They are Hispanics from Puerto Rico. When they first came here, they went into one of our little redneck mom-pop restaurants. I won't name it in the area because I don't want to offend anybody. They're both Hispanic. Brother Peter's a little more chocolate than, the, than Izzy. They wouldn't serve them in the restaurant because they thought they were a biracial couple. They are missionaries that go all over the world. And it was through that type of incident that I came in contact with them. I, at the time, our church had about 400 people strong in it. I told everybody in my church, I said, don't step foot inside that restaurant. <laughs> and I went and told the manager the same thing. I said, there's 400 people in my church, and most of them would come over here and have dinner after church on Sunday. None of them are coming back. Amen? Amen. We, we are not, Jesus is not racist. <laughs> he is not, and neither are we. But thank God, we've been involved with this brother for many, many years. He now has a ministry called Elijah's Cave Ministry, and it was established to provide support to pastors. They go around and minister to pastors. More than 2,500 pastors around the world not only quit the ministry, but quit serving God every year because they just can't handle the pressure, they can't take the criticisms, they can't take all the things that come with leadership. Pastor Peter and Izzy go around the world encouraging pastors, helping them to have the tools, and they, they minister to them to help them just hang in there and stay the course. God recently, within the last year, has opened up the doors. Now, Brother Peter can speak Spanish, and God has opened up the doors for him to go into Cuba. He's been there once. He's getting ready to go back again. And Cuba is a communist country that does not allow the preaching of the gospel. <laughs> but our brother Peter that we help support, God has opened the door for. And they do that ministry. Now, that's our world outreach. That's what we're doing around the world. And all of us are doing it together. As we give, we're all doing that together. Amen. Now I want to talk to you about what we're doing here in the United States. All right? The Bible said start where you are, minister out from that circle, and go as far as you can go. <laughs> and we're doing that. I hope you can see the importance of being a part of a local church family. You know, this church started as a Bible study in somebody's basement in their home. But if we would have just stayed a Bible study in a basement in somebody's home, we would never have all of us together and be able to reach the world with this kind of impact. And the more of us there are that are faithful and committed to God and serving together in the local church, the more far-reaching we can be. And I'm not done yet, man. There is more. We are supporting Dwayne and Diane Bristow. They are a part of BIC Navajo Mission. They're the, direction, or they're the directors rather, of a mission in Bloomfield, New Mexico. New Mexico is a wonderful place. I lived in Albuquerque all summer, one, one summer. When I got there, I thought that desert and dust and dirt and cactus was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. But after about three months, I said, I need green, I need mountains, I need floral. <laughs> And so I came back home. But these folks live there, and they minister to the Navajo Nation. You know why you're sitting here in church, 
but you're ministering to the Navajo Nation. Although there's a beautiful church building on the campus that they have, they hold services in the gymnasium because the Navajos will not attend a white man's church. <laughs> there's deep-seated native religious beliefs and long-nursed prejudice against white men. And that's just two of the many challenges that they have to deal with when they're ministering there. Alcoholism is rampant among the Navajo people. Dwayne leads an overcomers program to help people who are addicted to alcohol and drugs and Diane administers at a Christian school, and they have various programs that they run out there through the year to help the Navajo people and to bring them to Christ. Amen? Good stuff. Then we have something we talk about around here a good bit, and we call it ASP, and most of you scratch your head and think, ASP, what's that? That stands for Appalachian Service Project. It's a ministry that is mostly in Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. The reason being is that there are thousands of volunteers from around the country go to rural central Appalachia to repair homes for low-income families. There are families still in this day and age, hundreds of them, that are living in poverty in this country, that live in houses that don't have windows in the wintertime. They don't have sufficient windows and heat and roofs on them leaking and everything else, and they don't have the money to do anything with it. And so these teams, we have teams from our church and there's teams from all over the country, they get together, they, they find out a particular need, a particular area or house or family, and then they put the money together, they get the materials together, and they go with the skills that they have and they fix these people's homes and Share the gospel. Jesus fed people loaves and fishes. you got to meet people's immediate needs, their material needs, their hunger needs before you can share them the gospel. You can't just say to a hungry person who has no roof over their head, be warmed and filled, Jesus loves you. You have to go and do things, and so they do that. We also have local outreach here. We have some other initials we use, H-A-P-C, Hagerstown Area Pregnancy Clinic. <laughs> it is on the local forefront of the Choose Life campaign. They face overwhelming pressures because many women consider abortion as the only way out from an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. The mission of the Hagerstown Area Pregnancy Clinic is to share with each of these women the joy of trusting God's plan, overcoming fear, and choosing life for their babies. The clinic provides pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, education on abortion and STDs and HIV education. They teach them medical, legal, and housing counseling, adoption and community resource referrals, and an earn while you learn program. Every year, they do what they call baby bottle campaign. That's what you're seeing up here. This is Lori Sign. She is the president and director down there. That baby bottle represents a baby bottle campaign that they do every year. This is how they raise the money to pay for the people that work there full time and for the equipment that they need and the secretarial things that they have. They do it through this baby bottle campaign. And every year at a certain time, we bring these baby bottles in, usually about 200. Amanda, do you know how many this year we had? Anybody know? I know we raised over $4,000. And all we ask you to do is put your change in those bottles. Just put your leftover change, or you can put a check or cash or whatever you have, but, but just fill that bottle up with something, bring it in here, and we turn the money into them, and that's how they run the Hagerstown Area Pregnancy Center. We are, if we are not the biggest, we're one of the biggest donators to their ministry down there to help them. Now let me tell you what that $4,000 turns into. 144 babies this past year, rather than being aborted, were saved through the ministry of these people and interacting with these young families as they come in. That was added to what they call the tree of life. They've got a tree of life down there that they actually put the names and the numbers of these babies on there that they save. And over the time that they've been doing this, up to this past year, 2016, there's been a total of 1,756 babies saved. 
You're helping to do that. You're giving to do that. That brings me to a place called Holly Place. Any of you know what Holly Place is? Some of you do, I know, because you're actively involved in it. We're all involved in it. Holly Place is an assisted living facility located in Hagerstown. It was organized to serve those who cannot afford commercial assisted living, but require assistance with activities of daily living and have no other place to go. Some rev residents have no other income except their Social Security, and some have no family at all remaining. Holly Place serves 15 residents in a clean, safe, and home-like environment. Our women's ministry, we have a monthly women's ministry that meets here at New Life. They adopted Holly Place as their service ministry several years ago. They provided gift bags for each of the residents at Christmas. They collect supplies for daily use and provide opportunities for fellowship with the residents through games and dinners and other activities that they share. So here are some things not only that you can give to, that we all give to, but you can actively become involved in actually going there and ministering to people if you want to. And then there's reach of Washington County. Our church is busy. It ain't no wonder we're tired all the time around here. Reach of Washington County began in 1990 as a 24-hour emergency service for homeless families, providing emergency housing, food, prescription medications, and more. Today, Reach partners with the area faith community to operate a year-round day resource center where counties' residents facing housing crisis or having other urgent needs can come for resources, referrals, and a listening ear. REACH also operates a cold weather shelter for homeless adults, complete with case management to help clients move from homelessness to self-sufficiency. Whenever you're trying to help those that are in need, you don't always just want a meet, to meet a need and walk away. You want to meet that need, but you want to help raise them up, if you can, to a higher level to where they can be self-supported, those sort of things. We do that in every ministry that we have. Now, the original 24-hour crisis program continues to address urgent housing needs that arise outside of normal office hours. You ever ride around Hagerstown in the wintertime and you see some of these street people and you see them standing out and wonder, do they have somewhere to go? Is there anybody that cares? Is there somebody that can take care of them? And if you're like me, the next thought you have is, they're probably a serial killer. I cannot put them in the car with my family. <laughs> but then you kind of drive on down the road and you still feel bad because you think, man, what if they're not? And what about how do we meet that need? Well, you're helping to meet that need through REACH. That is the ministry that they do, and you are a part of it. Brings me to the next part. Uh, I can get it for you later. I don't know it right now, brother, but if you hang around and talk with me afterwards, my secretary radar, I'm sure knows. All right, the Hub Network. Several years ago, local faith community leaders met with administrators from this local community and some of our church leadership to try to develop a means of opening communication and resources between the two. Clients who have exceeded the resources available to them are often referred to churches to find additional funds. Churches were often overburdened with requests for assistance and had no way of coordinating their efforts. And so the Hub Network was created. The network opened lines of communication between the community, resource agencies, such as Community Action Council, the Department of Social Services, and the faith community, churches, and ministries who provide assistance. It allows them to coordinate their efforts, helping clients towards self-sufficiency and making them less dependent on community resources. As a result, more people who really need help are being assisted, and all of our resources go further. Now, what all that means is this. We are always getting people knocking on the door of the church and saying, I need help. Churches, just like you and I as people and families, we don't have unlimited resources. That means if we try to help every person that comes to the door, whether they are sincerely in need or not, people say, well, you know, you just go ahead and help everybody and then God will take care of it. Well, the problem with that is this. If we help somebody that really isn't in need, then the next person that comes along that is in need, that we don't have the funds and the resources to help, is in trouble. So we have to find a way to sort that out. Now, I know you good people would never do this, but there are people that knock on our door all the time, and they'll say, help me feed my kids. I need you to help me feed my kids. And that's all right, but you look down, and they've got $2,000 worth of tattoos down their arm, cigarettes in their pocket, a cell phone in their hand while they're talking to you. But they want you to feed their kids. And a lot of times, we've got a lot of drug addicts, crackheads. There's hotels around here, cheap ones. 
The crackhead guys are laying in the hotels. They send their girlfriends with their kids to knock on the church doors to get more money. And a lot of them, even if you help them, they're going to take the money back. And instead of feeding their kids, you know, Mr. So-and-so laying around is going to take the money and use it for what he always uses it for. What Hub does is we came together as a community here in Washington County as a faith community, as some of the social work community. We set up an office where we can keep track, because this is another thing some people do. Some people try to live off the church. They'll come here and give you a sob story, and you'll give them money, and then they'll leave right here and go right down to the next church down the road, and they'll give them a sob story, and the next thing you know, they're making a living off of their sob stories. What Hub Network does is help us keep track of all of that. As soon as somebody comes to the door, we get in touch with Hub Network, and have they been to other churches? Have they been here? Have they been there? Now, most of the time, it's try to get them the right help that they need, but it also helps us to flag those that are just abusing the system, as we call it. But we're involved in that. Our leadership here is involved in that. And I'm going to share some other outreach opportunities with you, but before I do, Jake and Debbie Shank, are you in the sanctuary? Where are you? They're not. They're wor Jake, come on up, buddy. Where's Deb? Deb, come on over here. These folks have been with me probably the last 25 years of ministry here at New Life, almost as long as I've been in the ministry. Just turn around and face them there. Hug that pretty girl. The reason I'm having them come up here, they are the directors of all of our outreach ministry. They are the ones that oversee these things. They head up our mission board. They do mission trips overseas. They take these groups when they go. Everything that I talked to you about this morning, they oversee and they help make happen. Will you give them a big hand? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I love you folks. Yeah, you can, you can sit down. You may be seated too. All that good food and stuff you're getting over in the cafe, Debbie heads all that up too. So they're, they're just awesome people. They really are. New Life plans a portion of our budget every year for missions and community outreach. We prayerfully consider every request and provide support as God provides the means and the opportunity. I want to give you just some of our local outreach ministry, softball ministry. Aren't they beautiful? That's the softball team for this year. You say, well, they're just playing softball. Oh, no, they're not. They're out there sharing the Christ that's in them with everybody on that ball field and with each other. <laughs> Amen. And that's one outreach ministry that we have. We have a men, and, men and women's ministries that meet here on a monthly basis to minister both to the men and the women. We've got a craft group that meets here to put together things to put in some of those Christmas boxes. Amen. They're not in the sanctuary, but we have a Living Out Loud children's ministry. It's our Christian Ed department. They're over there now ministering to the children that come into our church and they're reaching out in the community. We have a youth group that has an outreach. Andy and Nicole, I think they're over there with some youth now. They're not here this morning either in the sanctuary. We have One Way Cafe ministry. The second Saturday of every month, second Saturday of every month, there is a music group that comes in here. They're over next door. They serve free food to everybody that comes. People sit around tables and they have food and they have the ministry of music. They give testimonies. They share the gospel. They take time to pray with the people that are there and are reaching out to the community. Every once in a while, a few of those people will just kind of wander over here and become a part of our church family. But most of the time, that room is filled with people over there. And a lot of times, it's people that most of us wouldn't even bother with. And the people that do do that ministry over there, they treat them just like royalty. They treat them just like Jesus, because that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And that ministry is going on. We have a van ministry. Maybe my van driver's in the sanctuary. If you are, wave at me. Davey's back there, John. These two guys and their families show up really early every Sunday morning, get these vans out here and truck across town and make it possible for others to be in here and be a part of our church and to know Christ. We've got a parish nurse ministry. We have registered nurses that are a part of our church family. They have the, it looks like the uh, nurse's office when you went to school. 
It's there for emergencies, but it's there before church that, you know, if you need your blood pressure checked, anything they can do that they don't need to be a doctor to do, they'll help you with. A lot of times they can answer questions and it's free. We have a Facebook page, New Life Christian Ministries. The last I looked at it, over 49,000 people in 17 different countries are viewing the messages. We, we record, videotape the messages. Every week, there's anywhere from 250 to 600 people per week that view those messages through that Facebook page. All over the world. That blows my mind. But you are helping to provide that in our tech crew back there. We have a church website. And uh, Brother Fred, who leads up that area of ministry, he, he sent me a, a statistic sheet. I didn't even know this. The website in the past year has had over 40,000 hits on that website. We had 44 people in our Wednesday evening Bible study this past Wednesday, and one of them was a pastor that had gotten off the highway to get gas and decided to look on his phone and see what God was doing on Wednesday nights in our area, and he showed up and came to, <laughs> came to our Bible study, and he left with a message. He said, I now know what I'm going to be preaching in my church this Sunday, something Pastor Bill McPherson had shared. You just never know how God is touching people. I looked at the statistics. In the past year, I counted them up, Fred, 888 messages have been downloaded. And you know what download means? That means I downloaded it onto some kind of digital thing because I'm going to share it with somebody. And they downloaded the messages just from the website alone. We have free CDs that we give out every Sunday. These messages are taped. We've got high-speed copiers back there. you got to get there quick because they can only do so many high-speed really fast. But you can sign up. But they're free. How many of you know nothing's free? You know, <laughs> your tithes and offerings are helping to pay for that. But the reason we want to give those CDs out is we want you to take them and share them with people and let the Word of God change people's lives. Now, I'm almost done. You hanging in there? We're going to be done. Well, I'm going to pray, and we're just going to be done. Last year, God opened a window of opportunity to reach out to the people in Richfield, West Virginia. Remember last year when West Virginia was being inundated with floods? This so blesses a pastor's heart. I didn't go to the, to the ministry director, I didn't go to any of the ministries, but there was a group of people, about a dozen or so, who on their own decided to raise funds, to get the materials that they needed, to adopt the families down there, and took off on their own and did several trips down there to help people. <laughs> yeah, that's what Christianity's about. That's what church is about. You don't have to wait for somebody to put a fire behind you, just get her done. And that's what they did. They went down there and they ministered and helped restore a home. Another opportunity for us to share in our community came through a different type of disaster. Hospice of Washington County was in the process of building their first hospice house in Hagerstown. How many of you have had somebody from hospice minister to you, a family member, or somebody that you know? I tell you, if you get somebody terminally ill, and I know there's always a few bad apples in every bunch, but very seldom is there in hospice. If you have somebody in your family is terminally ill, that you're going to be there with them until the end of their lives, trust me, you want to know hospice and the people that minister through it. And uh, they were building a house with, that helped people with uh, pain and symptom, pain symptom management, respite services, or a place to be cared for with compassion and dignity in their last days. And they will no longer need to leave the county once the doors are open. It's called Doey's House. Sadly, right before it got completed, it caught fire and it burned down and fire swept through the unfinished building, completely destroying it. We as a church have joined with the rest of the community to help donate money and resources to help rebuild Doey's house. You've been doing that and didn't even know it, most of you, did you? You are helping your community, your church family, and you as a Christian. Once the construction is complete, a paid walkway will commemorate those who have had a part in it, along with dedications and memorials. We're not so much worried about it, but there's going to be one that says New Life Christian Ministries right in the sidewalk. <laughs> Amen. Good stuff. Healing and compassion, and I'm going to, I think I'm getting done. Healing and compassion was a large part of Jesus' ministry, and we believe that it is part of the great commandment. So in addition to mercy ships, New Life will be donating to this. Listen, you, you ever seen this little guy? On, give, me, give me the next slide there. Seen these kids? Give me one more. Yeah. 
I'm, yeah, the kids with St. Jude's. We are, we are donating money to Shriners Hospital. You ever sit home, you know, usually around Christmas time, and these little kids come up, and they're talking about what's going on at these hospitals and think, man, I'd really like to be able to do that, but I don't know that it fits in the budget. You're already doing it. You're already doing it. Next time you see it, say, thank God, I belong to New Life Christian Ministries. We're already doing it. We're doing the same thing with St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Now you can bring that little fellow up. I love this little guy. We got a picture of the little guy. Where is he? Da, 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 da. Nope. Carl, did you put that little boy's picture in there? It's in there somewhere. Keep going. Keep going. There he is. I love that little guy. He comes on television, man. He is awesome little dude. And, and he is doing everything he can to help St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Shriners. You're a part of that. Amen? Oh, I just wanted to share that with you today. This is our missions Sunday. I want you to know what you personally are doing to change the world, both here in our area, across this country, and around the world. Are you hungry? Are you? Stand up. I, I'm going to let Pastor Henry come dismiss us and pray. Pray over their food, Henry. They're all going to run out and eat. They don't, they don't even have time to pray this morning over the food. Amen. But can I say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do and all that you give and all the ways that you serve as a church family. One of us by ourselves, we may not feel like we're doing that much, but I'm telling you, all of us together, the devil knows we're here. He knows we're here. Amen? Glory to God. Thank you, Pastor Henry. A lot of places to get plugged in there, weren't there? Yes, there is. So, yes, there is. Just a hint. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify your name. Father, we thank you for all these opportunities that we have to minister to the world, Lord God. Father, continue to use us and anoint us in a great and mighty way. Father, I pray over the people now. Father, let them be the head and not the tail. Bless them as they come in and bless them as they go out. Prosper them in all that they do. Let there be great signs, wonders, and miracles. Follow them all the days of their life. And Father, I speak divine health over every person in this room, Lord God. Father, remind them how much you love them this week. And Father, call them, Lord. Father, they're the place that they need to be. Father, let us have an open heart and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Father, bless your people now. Keep them safe as they go their way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.